Welcome into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein. Uh, today, along with my co-host and partner in crime, my co-conspirator, the Dr. Jimmy Bucciolato. Hey, now. Hi, everyone. Just want to remind you, please uh, subscribe to our video channel on YouTube. Please subscribe to our audio podcast or on Spotify, Google, Apple. Please like and follow us on social media. Yeah, like, share, subscribe, uh, spread the word. Please. We're growing every day, so uh, keep on giving you great content. Uh, another full edition of the OG. We're uh, kind of bo- uh, zooming in or, or, or uh, you know, from satellite. Uh, Jimmy from his house uh, in Gross Point, Michigan. Me uh, from my crib uh, in Warren, Michigan, repping the east side. Yep. Even though I'm a west sider. I live <laughs> on the east side now. Uh, today, we are going to talk about kind of have a, a, a nice debate uh throw out some iconic images some iconic names some iconic gangland slains and kind of break them down the the top mob murders in history that took place in the summer months so like the summer hit parade uh famous murders that took place in june july and august and um there's not as many as you think but uh the ones that did take place in the summertime were were bombshells, uh, big headline grammars, uh, big headline grabbers, and um, things that made you know global headlines, not just uh, headlines nationally. So, uh, Jimmy, how do you want to start? You want to go uh, bottom up or or top down? Yeah, I think I think we can go um, bottom up, and we'll we'll start with a couple of honorable mentions. But it is interesting what you said about. I agree. The summer months, there's not as many as you would think. And that's interesting because traditionally, just in general, crime rates usually go up in the summer and it makes sense, right? It's warmer. People are out and about more. So it's kind of interesting that in in the underworld, though, um, not so much, at least in at least in terms of homicides. It's not really the the case. And I would just also add, uh, you know, we like to mix it up. And a lot of the time we talk about contemporary events, but sometimes we like to look at historical studies historical case studies. And uh, so we, we we keep on trying to bring diverse content, both in terms of long format episodes, but some are quick hitters. Sometimes we talk about the Italians. Other times we talk about other groups. Sometimes it's historical. Sometimes it's current. And, and we feel pretty strongly about that. Like, so things don't get stale. They don't get stagnant. Like, you know, every few weeks cycling through a different kind of way of thinking about this topic. So I think this is a good example. Yeah, and the, the the show isn't original mobsters, it's original gangsters. Yeah. And a gangster is not just an Italian mobster, it's not just uh uh Don Corleone or a John Gotti. A lot of different uh versions and and lanes and spaces in this genre that we like to try to color color them all up and and you know hit all the nooks and crannies. Yeah, so we can start. Let's start with a couple of honorable mentions and then we'll go into the uh then we'll go five, four, three, two, one. So I'm just going to you know throw out three, four, five uh, ones that are just kind of off the top of my head that were consequential, but probably didn't reach the level of iconoclast as uh, the five that we're going to talk about in the top five. Uh, let's start with Mikey Cangellini in Philadelphia. The 30th anniversary is actually this week of Mikey Chang's murder uh, in South Philly. Him and Joey Merlino were crossing the street in the middle of that crazy 1990s uh mob war, the shooting war that had erupted uh, between 91 and 94-ish. And summer of 93, Mikey Chang and Joey Merlino walking across the street, 600th block of Catherine, uh, outside of their social club hangout. And um, Mikey Chang is is shot right through the heart, dies in Joey Merlino's arms. Joey Merlino ends up going and winning the war and taking over the family. And now we're 30 years later, and, uh, you know, the FBI believes that... uh, Joey, and then we're, we're looking at a picture right now of, of Mikey on the left and uh, his brother, Johnny Chang, who allegedly is one of Joey's top lieutenants now, has been an underboss, uh, wasn't on the street when um, the Cangolini family broke apart at the seams in this mob war where you had two brothers trying to kill each other, Mikey and, and Joey Chang. But, you know, as we talk about it or talk, kind of give an analysis of 30,000 foot view um when we're talking about this and then we'll move on to a couple other ones with him specifically 
he's reached like folk hero status in South Philly 30 years later. Um, and I don't know if I can say that about all these other ones that, that we'll talk about in terms of not the top five, but you know, Mikey Chang is, um, you know, he kind of serves as a, a cautionary tale, a hero, uh, an anti-hero, uh, a, a folk hero, someone that is very revered in, in, you know, South Philly gangland lore, uh, and will always be kind of spoken about in, in glowing terms from the people that loved him because as, as intimidating as he could be. And the, and the guy was, a I always describe him as a force of nature. Um, and, and he was quick with the trigger, but, uh, he was also had a soft side to him and, and was very beloved by a lot of people. I, I, I've never heard anyone, um, trash Mikey chain. Yeah. It's a, it's a tragic story. I mean, obviously they, they chose that life. So I'm not trying to be naive about it nevertheless a family split like that you can't help but but see it as somewhat tragic and also it's uh shakespearean in a way yeah. too and it reminds you of some of the stuff that was going on in sicily like during the 80s where sometimes and not only just forget about guys within the same borgata turning against each other but literally blood relatives on each side of that that conflict and i know joey merlino at the time uh did not have any kids and i don't believe he'd been married Debbie yet. Uh, and Mikey was married with kids. And I know Joey was kind of famous for, for telling his widow, Mikey's widow that I, I, you know, if I could, I would have changed places with him. You know, I didn't have a family, you know, he's leaving a bloodline behind. Yeah. Now Joey's got kids and, you know, they're uh, beautiful young women going to live their lives and thank God he, he was able to do that. But, uh, so that, that's tragic. Um, let's move, move on. And, uh, Real quick, uh, out of New England, we've done a lot of New England lately, uh, LCN in New England and uh, Boston, Providence. This was out of Connecticut, uh, Hartford, um, New Haven, Billy the Wild Man Grasso, underboss to Junior Patriarcha, uh, and there was a, a coordinated hit, kind of like what you saw in Sopranos um, at, the end of the, uh, see, at the end of the series when New York tries to kill New Jersey, they, they try to hit them all at the same time. Um, and that's what they did uh, with, with Cadillac Frank and Billy the Wild Man. And Billy the Wild Man was killed. Cadillac Frank survived that assassination attempt and, and went on to take over the family. But this was right in the, the peak of the tensions in, in the Boston Mafia War of the late 80s, early 90s in, um, in, in June of 1989. Yeah, that was, wouldn't you say that was probably the, the most high profile casualty of that conflict. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Grasso was, uh, he was, they called him the wild man for a reason. He was a lunatic, um, very, very, uh, capable, had a lot of bodies. That's why junior patriarcha uh, wanted him around. He junior patriarcha. We've talked about was not a strong boss right. and needed guys like Cadillac Frank and uh, Billy Grasso, uh, you know, as buffers, as, as fronts, um, because people wouldn't mess with them the way they would mess with Junior or try to mess with Junior. Uh, Billy started, uh, got his, you know, made a transfer from the New York uh, five families to Raymond Patriarcha Sr. because he had been locked up with Raymond Patriarcha in the 70s. They were cellmates. And, uh, and there was also, you know, a time when there was a lot of Patriarcha power in Connecticut. And these, there's still a crew there. There's been a crew there, but that was when it's, you know, in the, in the mid to late eighties, that's when that Connecticut crew uh, really had a lot of sway in, in the patriarchs. Example also, as you point out, it is cinematic, the, because you can't help but think of the Godfather baptism of fire scene where they, they whack out like the heads of the five families. This is sort of a, a, a miniature version yeah. of that, but in real life, I think it was, they got, Salemi first. It was supposed to be a breakfast at a, a international house of pancakes uh, in Saugus, Massachusetts. He dodged it. Took like six or seven bullets. Uh, took refuge in a pizzeria uh, at a nearby strip mall. And uh, I think either at that exact same time or shortly thereafter, that was in Massachusetts. Then in Connecticut, at around that same time on that same day in June of night, I think it was June thirteenth. I could be wrong, but. Uh, Billy Grasso was picked up, told that he was going to a meeting, um, I believe in, in Worcester, uh, in Worcester, 
and uh, was killed by his own guys uh, in the car on the way to, or in the van on the way to the meeting. And his body was dumped uh, on the banks of the Connecticut River. Um, going over to Cleveland, uh, August 1976, the underboss of that crime family, Caligaro Leo Lips Mosheri, was Colojero. Colojero was uh, <laughs> was was murdered. Uh, we're assuming he was murdered. Most ninety nine point nine nine percent he was murdered. Um, I would say a hundred percent. Never found his body. They found his uh, his car with a lot of blood in the trunk. Was killed in the Irish Italian Mafia War of the late seventies. Danny Green versus Jack White Licavoli. Uh, Leo Lips was Jack White's best friend and first cousin. They had come from Detroit together uh, after Prohibition into the Ohio Rackets. And in the 70s, uh, Jack White took power and all hell broke loose uh, with Danny Green, the head of the, the area's Irish mob, uh, refusing to get in line behind Licavoli. Danny Green's eventually uh, a victim of this war himself. He's he's blown up in a car bomb in 77. But it was a very bold move and uh, something that ruffled a lot of feathers. He didn't just go after a soldier or an associate or a capo. You know, they killed the number two man in that whole crime family to the point where I know Tony Salerno in New York was so worried. He was calling uh, for meetings with the Cleveland guys being like, if you don't fix this problem, we're going to come in there and fix it for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that case study is really interesting. I love the uh, Mosheri connections to Detroit. And obviously, there was a lot of confusion with the early literature. He was another one of those guys who they would say was a purple ganger, him and, and the lick of which which wasn't true. They were river gang. They they knew the purple gang guys, you know, but they they were they weren't part of the purple gang. But um, is um, I can't remember. Uh, Leo is um, his was brother, his brother was Joe, Joe Misery. His brother was Joe Misery, who was yeah. a capo. And the Detroit mob from when it started in the early 30s to when he was killed in 68. But it wasn't a mob related killing. That was he a was, weird one. Yeah, He hung out at like a warehouse in Detroit every day. I think I don't know if he owned it or took a paycheck from there. And it was just like him and his buddies would sit around the old timers, sit around and play cards and and bus balls. And some young African-American kid uh, went in there to, to rob the place. And didn't realize who he was shooting. Right. And so um, shameless self-promotion, but I usually don't do this, but I have a picture of the Mosheri brothers in my in my book from from the old River Gang. And uh, this is uh, early organized crime in Detroit. So um, shameless self-promotion. But Mosheri is a well-known name from Terracini. So there are a lot yep. of connections between Licavoli's and Mosheri's in both. Detroit and Cleveland. But yeah, I I love this case study. I mean, obviously it's tragic someone's killed, but um there there was a series of sit-downs leading up to that where where Nardi, who was like Danny Green's kind of like sponsor, his, Ita Italian, his Italian right co-sponsor. Right, right. Um who wasn't and, made, who wasn't made by the way, but had kind of the power of a made guy. Yeah, he he was he was juiced in with the Teamsters and um but he um and and that's and he he they want he was gonna take over he, wa he wanted he was, to get made and then become right, the boss when right. John Scalish died right uh but they gave it to Jack Jack White right so but they had a series of sit downs and Nardi was telling Mosheri to go fuck himself like literally that's what he was saying to him and and so Mosheri I mean it was just like the underboss like a non made guy <laughs> tell the underboss and there to was go a, fuck himself so this the, the it was escalating like rapidly there was a, so he disappeared I want to say he disappeared on the thirtieth or thirty first or ended up not around anymore. And I think on August 26th or 27th, so a couple of days before that, there was a, um, you know, like a, a street fair feast, uh, uh, celebrate the end of summer. And they were all at the Italian American club uh, on, a, I think it was Murray Hill, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there, Little Italy. And there was a very heated verbal altercation between Nardi and Mosheri, mm -hmm. where they're yeah. screaming at each other uh, across the the hall. The, the, they they the spit in each other's face. I think, yeah. if I'm not yeah. mistaken, yeah. it was yeah. very like uh, um, dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> and so then, just to finish off with uh, two other ones uh, from our hometown of Detroit, the last made member of the Detroit Mafia, most likely the most 
most likely the last made member of the Detroit Mafia uh, to be murdered. Uh, Pete, Fast Pete Cavatayo, longtime soldier, had a lot of uh, relatives in the family. And uh, Fast Pete uh, wore out his welcome, got a button at a young age, never, uh, never was able to rise past soldier because he was a loud mouth that got on a lot of people's nerves, was known for uh, abusing people, sleeping with people's wives when they were away in prison. Uh, stealing from uh, mob administrators in joint rackets. And uh, he was always protected by his dad and uncle and then by his brother-in-law, uh, Detroit Fats, Dom Corrado. And Dom Corrado died in late June 1985. And the, the way the story was told to me was that his murder contract was actually issued at the wake by his other brother-in-law, uh, Tony the Bull Corrado. And there's a lot of that murder of Cavatai was never brought to justice. He wasn't just murdered. He was tortured and then murdered. Uh, they were looking for a, a safe that they believed that he had taken money from uh, or had taken money from other people, put into a safe and was hiding it somewhere. They never were able to get the, uh, the information out of him. They just killed him. But uh, eventually one of the members of that hit team went in front of the grand jury. Uh, in the 1990s, his name was John Pree, and he eventually recanted the testimony. But when he went in front of the grand jury, he implicated very, very high ranking members of the Detroit Mafia, guys that are in power today uh, in that murder. And those guys are, are lucky that that Pree recanted and, and uh, that indictment was never brought. But it also yeah. allegedly involved the outlaws, another kind of cross section between the the mafia italian mafia and the bikers yeah, it's an, it's an interesting example of where there's others in the underworld where basically one one influential guy is keeping him alive he's he's, he's keeping the wolves at at bay and, and and when he dies that that you know that that's it time to go even his mo the word was the, the rumor was that even his mother who was the sister of the godfather joe zarilli even I should say, even his mother-in-law, not his mother. I apologize. Even his mother-in-law, uh, Dom Corrado's mother, and Tony Corrado's mother, um, allegedly was eager uh, for him to be murdered as well. Um, he was mistreating Dom and Tony's sister, uh, and, and that that was also an issue. And Jimmy, just we were talking about this off air, and before we jump into the the top five. We talk about when there's these major mafia hits, it's very rarely does it come from one. Or it's only one reason this is happening. It's usually very layered mm -hmm. situations where there's like a accumulation of issues that result in a guy being hit. Yeah, there, a lot of times, right, it, the, what I refer to as overdetermined, there, there's a series of infractions <laughs> that are leading up to it. Now, now, once in a while, you'll have, the, like, the guy who's, like, a cowboy who's, like, it's one thing, and I'm like, I'm going to whack this motherfucker. <laughs> but usually, I agree with Scott that it's it's a, a multiplicity of uh, multiple issues kind of, co you know, converging into the decision to finally get rid of this person. Um, and then the last one I'll mention before we jump into the top five, uh, the Kansas City Mob War of the 1970s, the River Q, uh, sorry, the River Key War uh, over that entertainment district that uh, was being fought over by different factions of the Kansas City Mafia uh, and the big murder that kind of tipped off all of that violence that lasted between about 1976 and 1978 uh, was David Bonadonna. Uh, the, the one made member on the side against the Sevilla uh, crime family and was fighting to protect his son, Freddie Bonadonna, who had been the, you know, the driving force behind this huge renovation of a, a, a broken down part of that city that became known as the River, River Key. And uh, it was an entertainment district, restaurants, nightclubs. Uh, really happening in the 1970s, uh, at the start of the 70s. But by the mid-70s, the Sevillas, uh, more specifically their street boss, Willie the Rat Camisano, said, this is being run by one of our guys' sons, and we don't have a piece of this? We're not able to extort all these businesses and more 
importantly, we're not able to control the parking because uh, the, the parking in, in that uh, in that night district was a, a big, big, big time moneymaker. And David Bonadonna stood up to uh, Camisano and the Sevillas, tried to protect his son, and they ended up killing him, I believe, June 1976. And then, sadly, Freddie Bonadonna, who testified against a lot of those guys, uh, went on to commit suicide later later on. Well, and more more shameless self promotion. If you want to know more about this, a deep dive it. We check out our episode with Gary Jenkins, which I think was a video episode. We've had him on twice. One mm-hmm. once was just audio, but. When we talk about this case study specifically, I think that was a video episode. You can find that in our archives. So let's jump in. Let's go top five. Let's go from five uh, up to one. Yeah, so number number five, a handsome Johnny Roselli. I think, and by the way, Scott and I have a consensus on this. We we talked about this before, so it's not a back and forth. Um, handsome Johnny Roselli is our number five, and uh, he was originally a Chicago mafioso. He then was a member of the LA mafia. Well, I think, and, he, I think he was more of like a Chicago's representative in LA. I don't know if he was ever inducted yeah, into the LA. Yeah. I've read both. I, so I don't know for sure. I, I, but I've read both. I've, I've read that okay. he eventually did transfer and okay. was like a captain, but I, 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 I'm not an expert. Um, but I will agree with you that in some ways he's, so, he, he's one of these guys like Frankie three fingers Coppola. He's almost this like, um, like uh mafioso without portfolio kind of like just he's kind of everywhere yeah right now you can't just pin him down because then he's in florida he's yeah, got by, international connections so he started with capone in the 20s like what you said but by the late 20s early 30s he's being dispatched out to the west coast right. he's being dispatched down to florida uh he became a you know a mouthpiece for for bosses in different families in different parts of the country yeah, and um, eventually we'll we'll talk about the circumstances leading up to it. But the, just to you know uh, get right to it, they find his body in was it was it's August it's of August August of seventy six in Biscayne Bay and uh, around South Beach. Yeah, they find his body in an oil drum, so it was a pretty gruesome uh, situation. See, so asphyxiated, wrapped in chains, so it was a pretty gruesome find. And you can see there, you know, he was an older dude at that point. You can tell from the from the image if you're watching the video. And one thing that we didn't mention is he was also very well connected to the CIA. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't just a mobster. He had uh, a lot of connections to the intelligence community. And he was one of the principal actors in the plot to assassinate Castro, where Uncle Sam basically gives a contract, a murder contract to Cosa Nostra to assassinate Castro and uh, the principal actors there are Roselli, Roselli's Chicago friend and, and uh, fellow mafiosi Sam Giancana, but also Santo Traficante, who was the boss of, of Tampa. And so now it's kind of interesting. We don't want to digress too much here, but you know, you can, you can check out more promotion here for our friend, Scott DG, check out his book, silent Don. There's some stuff on Roselli here, but also he, he was on our, show recently if you're watching this you you'll already have access to that video but um so there there's this this idea that Traficante Giancana and Roselli the whole time thought that that plot was ridiculous and that that like, there's no way we can pull this off this is the stupidest idea but if you're willing to give us money and also provide cover from the FBI keep the FBI off our back We'll tell you what you want to hear. Yeah, sure. We'll fucking whack Castro. No. Sure. When really they they knew the whole time that that was very unlikely. It, wasn't it called Operation Mongoose? Yeah, right. And so the, the premise was the CIA, right? They're anti-communist. They want Castro out of there. But then, then the mafia is, will get their casinos back. And my understanding is in all likelihood, Traficante, Roselli, and those guys thought that it was very unlikely, pretty much impossible to kill Castro. But then they pretty much viewed it as a lost cause that like, we're never going to take Cuba back. So, but we'll play the game. We'll take, we'll take your money. And, and especially we want cover protection from the FBI. So he was a connected dude. Um, and he testified in, in front of the, you know, the church committee uh, a year before his murder, almost to the day. 
Right. And that's how we know that that's how we know a lot of what we know now. Eventually, some documents were declassified because of those congressional hearings. But guys like Roselli, he kind of um, was transparent about this and admitted some of his role. And a lot of researchers think or suspect that that played a role in his death. And so there's this interesting kind of conspiracy angle, which is to say, who killed Johnny Roselli? Was it the mafia? Was it the CIA? Or was it both? Because you know something that Scott Dietschy documents in his book is Roselli met with Traficante just days before he disappeared, basically to explain why he said what he said at the church committee hearings, and then he disappeared. So, you know, this could be another one of those overdetermined examples where it's like, did the mafia kill him? Did the CIA kill him? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, Ro- and we should tell you that Roselli was living in Florida at that point. Yeah. He wasn't just, yeah. I mean, well, if he's down there in the summer, you're living there. He yeah. wasn't a snowbird. <laughs> right. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, and he was living in, Bro- he was living in Broward County and was found in Dade. Yeah. So handsome Johnny Roselli, he's a real interesting, I think, I think he's one of the most interesting guys in the, in the history of, of Cosa Nostra because he's they, all over the place like that. I think they had a character uh, in the movie Nixon and the movie JFK. I think the, I think uh, Roselli was a character in both of those Oliver Stone yeah, I can't remember. Could be. And maybe what what about the movie with um Matt Damon with, with Joe Pesci? Was Joe Pesci supposed to be traveling? Yeah, it was supposed Roselli? to be yeah, remember. it was supposed to be like yeah, it it was supposed to be like a Roselli. Okay. It was a fictional yeah. name. Okay. But I think I, I think that's a strong number five, yeah. Johnny Roselli. So go to number four. So number four, speaking of uh Chicago guys, we've already mentioned him, uh Sam Giancana was our number four, the former boss of the Chicago outfit. Again, that that becomes complicated right there, we we have to acknowledge, because it's sort of like he was the boss, sort of like Tony Salerno was the boss of the Genovese. Like, (laughs) he was the boss, but but not really. (laughs) Right. Tony Accardo was the final say. Uh, Sam Giancana and Accardo were were very close uh, friends. They came up together. Uh, there's Giancana a great was classic photo. Sorry to interrupt, but there's that classic yeah. photo of them together, them and being in uh, shots. arraigned or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sam was in the 42 gang. Accardo and Giancana both worked for Capone. Uh, Sam really earned his stripes in terms of uh, becoming fast track for leadership uh, when he came out of prison in the late 40s and uh, sold. Accardo and and Paul the the Raider the, Paul the Waiter Rica uh, on taking over the black numbers racket, and it, it wasn't an easy thing to do. Uh, he lost his uh, uh, his bodyguard Sam Giancana lost his bodyguard uh, Fat Lenny uh, Fano, and but at the end of the day they ended up killing the the last remaining holdout uh, of the black numbers kingpins uh, Tough Teddy Rowe. And Giancana was caught on a number of wires in the years after that, showing admiration for Teddy Rowe. And I think what, there was rumors that he might have had a picture of Teddy Rowe somewhere in his office. Yeah, and so it was like, like, it's too bad we had to whack him or yeah, something like that, right? Yeah. Kind of attitude. We could have you know, turned him into a good worker for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Teddy Rowe wouldn't let the Italians come in there, into the south side of Chicago and a lot of those black neighborhoods. Uh, Giancana had actually learned about the racket from uh, Eddie Jones, who was a big time black numbers guy that he was locked, that Giancana was locked up with. And him and Eddie Jones decided to kind of go. And and Eddie Jones would be, in theory, the face of the Italian sponsored numbers guys. And yeah, I so, think the idea the idea was that if if Eddie Jones gets behind us, everybody else is going to fall in line. And some did, but a number didn't. A, a, a number of them didn't. And the most prominent of those guys was tough Teddy Rowe. Yeah. So I, I, G- Jim Conn is another fascinating guy because he's at this intersection of all these different things. As Scott points out, the, the, if you're interested in like African-American underworld in Chicago, which which we very much are, we're actually working on trying to get an episode going on at black gangsters of chicago but so he's connected to capone he's he's connected to the cia we already established that he's part of that castro plot but we haven't even mentioned yet he's also connected to the rat pack yeah john kennedy and, <laughs> john he was kennedy. the john Gotti before i mean in yeah. between al capone 
and John Gotti, there was Sam Giancana in terms of the national yeah. headlines, the reputation that spread from coast to coast in terms of somebody that loved the spotlight and fed off of uh, media fanfare, dating, cele- uh, dating female celebrities, hanging out with Frank Sinatra, hanging out with John Kennedy, sharing women with, sharing John, women, yeah. with John Kennedy and Frank Sinatra. That's right. And um, th- there's some real interesting stories about Gene Connor, like his sort of talking shit about Sinatra. Like, you know, Sinatra, everyone thinks he's a tough guy. He like, like I'm the fucking tough guy here. It ain't, yeah. <laughs> it, ain't it ain't Sinatra. Um, and uh, but yeah, and Gene Connor was also, as you point out, very flashy. Uh, probably the most conspicuous example, the most ostentatious example, is when he's testifying during the congressional committee hearings, and he shows up with his dark, wears his dark sunglasses, sunglasses to the yeah. whole in front of Bobby Kennedy <laughs> as he's as he's questioning him. So he he was a pretty showy guy which the reason why we're talking about all this is not only because it's part of the profile and he's an interesting dude but that probably plays a role in why he turns up turns up well i think you let's go let's take it back even further it plays a role in him getting deposed yes i mean accardo makes a decision with all the uh, heat from the media from the feds from the justice department by the late 60s it's in everybody's best interest for him to get out of town. Um, yeah. And he, Leaves I believe he was, I believe he was told to leave. Um, and uh, yeah, he went abroad and, and well, was bouncing around the middle East, uh, Europe, Mexico. eventually lands in Mexico, uh, was investing in a lot of casinos. Uh, there was rumors that he was investing. I don't even know if these were rumors uh, that he was investing with like, Heads of states like uh, the Shah uh, in, in, in Iran was investing with Giancana. They were making lots of money in uh, Middle East casinos, money that monies that were not being <laughs> shared with Chicago. There was no tribute check being sent back to the bosses in Chicago when when Giancana was away, and he comes back to town to Chicago. Um, I believe it was 73 or 74 and starts to try to put things together again. There are subpoenas coming from the church committee to talk about what was uh, going on with the Castro conspiracy stuff that uh, Johnny Rosselli was uh, also being called to testify that summer of 75 uh, was when the church committee was meeting in Washington and Sam Giancana was kind of believed to be more trouble than he was worth. They were worried about what he was going to say. They were worried or they were upset that he hadn't been sharing with them. And they decide to hit him. And in order to hit him, you got to get somebody that he will lower his guard down for. So there have been lots of theories. He was killed in his house. Um, I believe it was June um, of... uh, uh, June 15th, sorry, June 19th, uh, 1975. And um, then we, no more Sam Giancana. And all we're left is, uh, is, is to speculate on what happened. Uh, rumors that it could have been Tony Spilatro, uh, who was a, a former kind of protege of Giancana. Rumors that it could have been Butch Blassie, who was Giancana's driver and bodyguard. There were even rumors that it was Tony Accardo himself. Uh, that seems a little far-fetched. Came out from um, some people more recently. But it was definitely somebody that Giancana would have felt comfortable turning his back on because uh, Giancana was killed while he was in his kitchen cooking sausage and peppers for his guest. And his guest was also his killer. Okay, so another really compelling example here, number three, which at this point, I think any of these could be a candidate for number one at this point when we're talking about these top three. But we put the murder of Bugsy Siegel, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, at the number three spot. Didn't like being called Bugsy. That's right, right. So I figure we, we'd add the Benjamin part. And... One of the most iconic American gangsters of all time. I think Bugsy Siegel could possibly be on the Rushmore 
with uh, maybe Gotti, Capone, and um, uh, maybe Luciano. I don't know. If that, that could be he a top can, four. He was one of the pioneers of Las Vegas. I, I hesitate to say the pioneer because you learn as you as you deep dive it that he actually kind of took ownership of some other people's ideas. Yeah, but he he was really the the driving force, at least that that got Vegas to where you know planted the seeds for what we now know as Las Vegas. And another interesting guy like Giancana and Roselli, in the sense that he's everywhere. He starts off in New York. He's a Jewish gangster, close with Meyer Lansky, the Bugs and Meyer gang. And Bugsy also was very close with the Genovese. Well, it wasn't the Genovese yet. It was Luciano and Costello. Um, and so he works with the Italians. And he is a particularly violent guy, but he also has a reputation as a ladies man and a good looking guy. So he goes out to Hollywood initially, similar to what Scott was talking about with Roselli, is basically assigned to go out west and take care of the rackets there, get, get in with the, the labor unions in Hollywood and things like that. But but Siegel ends up loving it. He right? falls in love with Hollywood. <laughs> he falls in love with L.A. I mean, it's right? kind of a tailor. You know, isn't it a tailor made relationship? I mean, yeah. A oh, Hollywood yeah. gangster that actually goes to Hollywood and falls in love with Hollywood, falls in love with a Hollywood starlet. Yeah, he, he loves everything about it. The weather, the celebrities, the industry. He loves everything about it. And he starts hanging out with celebrities. And some of them he actually knew from back in New York, like George Raft and guys like that. But uh, he is, uh, of course, still a ladies man there. And. But he's also involved in the rackets there, right? He he's taken over loan sharking, gambling things on on behalf of, of Lansky and the and, and Luciano. And let's, let's just spell, you know, people that might get their history from the movie Bugsy, which is an we excellent movie. movie. Yeah, it's a, a, and an movie. underrated movie. I agree. Um, in terms of the genre, I, I think it's it's as top flight and as elite as you know the the ones that we talk about. But it, just different kind of story. But uh, they make out the guys in LA uh, Jack Dragon and them to be real pushovers. There's a, there's a scene where uh, Warren Beatty's Bugsy makes Jack Dragon, you know, crawl on the floor like a pig or a dog. And that I understand that there, you got to make your point from a, a dramatic license point of view and show what a badass uh, Bugsy was. And it's a, and it's actually a great scene after he embarrasses Jack Dragon, he goes and, and there's a scene where he's eating a meal that Annette Benning cooks for him. He's, it's like he's a caveman. Um, he's got blood kind of running down his cheek. And it, I think it does a great job of capturing kind of a, 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 a snapshot of who he was and what that relationship was. It like turned her on to see him do that. And then, <laughs> and then after he embarrasses Jack Dragna, he goes to the dinner table and, and, you know, goes Fred Flintstone on a stage. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it's interesting because in a way, obviously, as you point out, that's highly dramatized. But he was a guy who was both suave, but also could be psychotic at the same time. And so I think that movie does a good job of capturing that. And one of my favorite scenes is with, with Dragna, where he plays Russian roulette. He pulls the trigger and obviously it doesn't go off. And he goes, see, even I can't kill me. Like, just because he's, he's, well, he's, and then a, there's he's the, a pot, so he's crazy. There's that great uh, dialogue where the. Again, I don't. This is not what happened, but the yeah. way that uh, uh, James Toback uh, wrote it for for Bugsy is that the first meeting he has with with Dragna, Dragna says that oh, we run a nice little operation here. He's like, yeah. "You're in the second biggest country or second biggest state in the whole country, and you have a nice little operation." <laughs> right, right, right. And and also has Mickey Cohen in there. So so who who was you know a guy working for another. Uh, iconic infamous jewish gangster who was working with with siegel so so siegel has all these interesting connections las vegas hollywood new york luciano lansky cohen all these all these guys siegel one of his harebrained schemes is he thinks he can kill mussolini during uh world Dude, war ii by romancing account accountess <laughs> which he was sleeping with her right. that's actually true <laughs> uh, 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 one of the aristocrats from from Italy. So he's just a really colorful guy, and and I agree with you. That film is underrated, even though a lot of it isn't true. It, it's a great film. So um, the but thing the murder... we didn't mention yet is is Virginia Hill, and yeah. I, I think that's a lot. That's a big reason why he ends up, you know, uh, number three on our list. Yeah, that's the Hollywood starlet that I was referencing. She was also known as a 
pretty infamous gun mole around the country. She had been with gangsters from New York to Chicago to L.A. Joey A. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and also, I think uh, a guy named Epst uh, Joe Epstein in, in um, Chicago, who was a Jewish gangster. And then it, in the movie, they make uh, reference to the, the bullfighter that she was <laughs> in yeah. in a relationship with. And uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, so she was someone that had infamy before she met Bugsy. Um, and then there's what led to the June 20th, 1947 murder. Um, and most of it, at least, can be tied to Las Vegas and the building and construction of the Flamingo, which became the first kind of modern day, not modern day, but. Uh, how would you explain the Flamingo? It was one of the first one or two casinos on yeah. what is now the Strip. I, I think that that was the the first example of this kind of all-inclusive, like we're going to have entertainment, swimming pools, casinos, like the, the whole thing, not just the sawdust joint that, you, you know, that you stay at a motel or something in Nevada. This was one of the first plush yeah. there hotel been complexes, there had been entertainment another complexes. There had been another casino or two on this what became the strip, but this mm -hmm. was the first, like you're saying, luxury, right? Um, supercharged casino hotel, uh, and it was it, it went way, way, way over budget. Um, the the money kept on that you were that were pouring into it kept on ballooning, and he was so obsessed with it, and possibly stealing from it, along with Virginia Hill. We don't know if Buzzy was stealing for himself. Was he stealing it with Virginia Hill? Was Virginia Hill stealing it and keeping it for herself and not sharing it with Bugsy? But there was money that was going missing. And as the cost kept on skyrocketing, Siegel's remedy was to go around and, and sell more pieces of investment into the property. and it, Which were empty shares. Which were empty shares. Empty shares. Yeah. Right. So you had all these, and then they open, and I think it was Christmas 46, and it's a big dud. Um, yeah. So there were, there were a lot of things to answer for, and I think Meyer Lansky had been protecting Bugsy for, for a period of time there, and it, it became a situation where Meyer couldn't stem the tide. And I... I I'm not going to say that I don't think Bugsy knew what was going on, but Virginia Hill and her behavior greased a lot of these wheels. And That's what, what I he, mean. What, what he was letting her get away with because he was so kind of sprung on her. Yeah. So the it, part one way of looking at it was it, either either he's in on it, and if he's not in on it, that he's too stupid to be in charge of this yeah. operation in the first place. And either way, th that's that's not good with the bosses in New York and. And also, this reminds me a little bit of a, a parallel with the Ralph Natale example, because yeah. because she was such an infamous, you, you know, kind of uh, mob groupie, for lack of a better term, or, or a mall. Um, the, the guys lost a lot of respect for Bugsy when when he when he was like really into her. He wasn't just banging her for yeah. lack of a better term. He was he was he was like uh, um, humiliating his wife. And his and his kids and and for a woman that had been had multiple partners in the underworld, I'm I'm not trying to be sexist or anything. I'm just that's just a fact. Um, guys were really puzzled that well, Bugsy would be so into her. Well, like and that. I think it was more than that. And to, to piggyback off of the Ralph Natale in Philadelphia in the '90s example, he started being Benjamin Bugsy Siegel started to bring Virginia Hill to business meetings. Yeah, to right. things that. No, in that world, no woman would be would be allowed to. And not only was she allowed to be there, she was allowed to voice her opinion. Yeah. And and she she's a she's a great character in her own right. One of my favorite examples from her was she was also uh, subpoenaed to testify before Congress. And it, it's one of the great moments in congressional history yeah. where they where they asked her, why, why do you think you were so popular with the other the, these mobsters? And she's I think I believe she said something like you know, sucking dick or something. <laughs> she, she, she was very vulgar. She, if you go back and look, you can, people can look that up and fact check. But whatever she said was very vulgar, like blowjobs or something. She said something very vulgar. And can you imagine back then, like, uh, I think that would have been in the 1950s, like uh, the blushing on the, on the yeah. part of all these, like, uh, half dead Dixie Krats or whatever the fuck were. 
<laughs> Congress back then. Um, so uh, it's just a great story, but unfortunately it ends up, doesn't go well. Benny, do you have the picture there um, up on screen of the, there you go. So he killed in Beverly Hills uh, in her, in Virginia Hills mansion, right? Right. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it actually wasn't his, in his name. Uh, and so he was uh, sitting there and I don't know if he was reading the paper. I can't remember, but a sniper. Yeah, uh, took him out. So it wasn't like somebody inside the house. It was um, I think Frank, uh, uh, either Frankie Carbo or, or Frankie Palermo, one of those, one of those guys who were involved in the the boxing trade. Uh, I believe that the the theory is that one of them was the trigger man. Okay, but yeah. I could be wrong. I, I don't consider myself an expert on on uh, Murder Inc. Or, or Bugsy, but I, I know when I was with Ralph, and take this with a grain of salt because it's coming from Ralph Natale, but uh, Ralph was very close to both Frankie Carbo and Frankie Palermo. Those, you know, they were titans uh, in the not just in the mob, but in the boxing industry. They, they controlled professional boxing, and uh, he told me that uh, I believe he told me Frankie Carbo was the shooter. But I, yeah, it, it, it's another one of those case studies that a lot of it's lost in the in lore whatever the, the phrase is because then there's other theories that actually luciano and lansky weren't behind it it was it was some other thing that siegel got in trouble with in la i tend to think it was the new york guys because of this because he was skimming from you, you know this this operation and but. he was shot through the eye which was then dramatized in, in the godfather when the mo green character which was inspired by lansky or sorry inspired by siegel uh, Hyman Roth character was inspired by That's Lansky. Lame. Yeah. And uh, in the movie, uh, he gets shot in the eye and the Sopranos. They, uh, they, 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 they coined the term a Mulgreen special. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, so, and I think because Bugsy Siegel was so iconic, it, it, you know, that, and it was so dramatic, Beverly Hills being shot in the face, um, national headline story. It easily, easily could be our number one, but it's not. So our number two, another one that could easily be at number one is, of course, the disappearance of labor leader Jimmy Hoffa. It's a topic we've talked about a lot, not only on the show, but Scott's written, published a lot about Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, we've both appeared on a number of documentaries talking about Hoffa. So it's in our backyard. It's a case study we're particularly interested in and study. So one of the reasons why I made the argument that this shouldn't be number one, it easily could be number one, but because it was just less dramatic in the sense of no body, uh, it was a disappearance. I think Scott used the, the, with the uh, Mosheri, like we're 99.9999999999% certain that this was a, this was a mob hit. So I definitely feel comfortable putting it in the top five. It was high profile, but because there was no body, like with these other examples, you know, they find, find the guy in the oil drum, Giancana shot in his kitchen, Bugsy's shot in the mansion. Um, no body. Therefore I think it's, it's, it's should be number two instead of one, but definitely one of the most high profile, in terms Mob of a murders in, in, in really the history of the underworld and in, in, in both going back to Sicily and the United States, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, in terms of Americana yeah. and pop culture, it's definitely number one. Yeah. But that's not that's not how that's not the metric that we're using to to put this list together. Yeah. Yeah. And and also and just in terms of like significance, because he was such a powerful political figure, not just an underworld. Figure. He was one of the most recognizable people on this planet. Right. Public figure, very yeah. public, very powerful, very juiced in terms of politics. And I can't really, when I talk about this case study with my students, I, I honestly can't think of a parallel today of what that would look like. I, I don't I don't think there is. And And if you can think of someone, the idea that they would be killed in an underworld thing to me is unimaginable yeah. today. I mean, that, that that's what that's how big of scale we're talking about. The, the disappearance presumed murder of Hoffa in 75. Yeah. July 30th, 1975 disappeared from Bloomfield Plaza, a uh, strip mall right down the street from where I grew up, uh, was going to a sit down at the Red Fox restaurant. Hoffa was going to meet Detroit street boss, Detroit mafia street boss, Tony Giacalone, New Jersey mafia capo, Tony pro Provenzano to discuss his desire to get back into the Teamsters Union. He had been the president for 13 years, stepped away in order to get a, a, a commutation on his sentence. He had been sent to prison, was supposed to do 11 or 12 years. 
if he gave up the Teamsters union, he could get that cut to like four or five years. He agrees to that, gets out, doesn't either doesn't understand or doesn't care that part of the commutation barred him from running for Teamster presidency again. He's the, 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 the huge part of the story that just gets buried. And I have no idea why this hasn't gained the traction that you thought it would. He started, he becomes a confidential informant for the FBI Yeah, uh, in the last year or two of his life and starts feeding them information on what he knows about the mafia and, and their role in the labor unions in exchange for their promise to get that ban on him running for Teamsters president lifted. And it, it was a certainty that if he would have ran, if he would have been allowed to run in the 76 Teamsters presidency, he would have taken back the union and he threatened to, to cleanse it of all organized crime influence, which at that point meant cutting off the Teamsters pension fund, which had gone to buy build back to Vegas, Las Vegas, uh, you know, numerous other business, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, worth of loans, billions of dollars worth of loans, uh, very low interest to, to very shady characters who then take those loans, invest them into businesses that they steal from. <laughs> um, and Extort, the, right. the mafia didn't want him there anymore. Even though the mafia is, are the ones that put him in, he was too much of a headache. Uh, and and was just really uh, quite full of himself. Didn't want to take orders. Thought that he was just as big of a deal as the mobsters that he had had become his benefactors. And when they told him to step down and go to Florida and retire, he started threatening them, going on national television and threatening them. So it was really just a matter of time. And and then the question you know that we've been trying to answer for fifty years now is. Where's the body and who did it? And I think we know <laughs> back to the 99.999% we know. And uh, so, you know, he was killed by the Detroit Mafia. He was an asset of the Detroit mob dating back to the 30s. He lived in Detroit. The Tony Giacalone was his, his point, his point man. Um, the Giacalones and the Detroit Mafia, I, I, I always say they had a PhD in mafia murder. Nobody's ever been convicted of a, a mob murder in the Detroit Toko's early crime family. And there's been dozens and dozens of them over the last 100 years. So uh, what I believe uh, is that they kidnapped him, that the car consisted of at least Billy Giacalone, Tony's younger brother, and Tony Palazzolo, who at the time was a, a young mob soldier. And they took him to another location where they said that he was going to have a sit down, that they, they moved it from the restaurant to a location he felt comfortable at. Most likely, I think it was Carl Lucata's house, which was the another mob soldier, Mafia Prince. His dad was the mob boss of L.A. His brother-in-laws were the acting bosses of the, the Toko brothers who were, who were running the family on an acting basis at that point. And they probably killed him at Lucata's house. And then I think they took him to Central Sanitation in Hamtramck and incinerated his body. Central sanitation burned down like a year later before the FBI could get a search warrant to go in there. It was most likely an arson. And the owners of central sanitation were followed by the FBI two days after Hoffa disappeared or three days after Hoffa disappeared to New York to meet with Tony Salerno and other members of the Genovese crime family. So I can button it up and, and tie it up into a nice little bow I don't think you're ever going to find a body and all these guys are dead. So you're not going to arrest anybody. Jimmy. Yeah, your, I, I, your I agree. Opinion? Yeah, I agree. That's the theory that I subscribe to too. And and by the way, you know, this is based on field research and interviews with former prosecutors, former FBI agents, also people who were in the underworld at that time. So um, I'm pretty confident in, in, in that theory that you just laid out that that's what happened. And just some more shameless self-promotion. Uh, you talked about the person who, who owns central sanitation and was sur surveilled in New York, Jimmy Quasarano. Yeah, Pete, who, who's, Pete Vitale and Jimmy Quasarano. Right. So Jimmy Quasarano was tied to Frankie Three Fingers Coppola, who we mentioned a little a few minutes ago and uh, big drug traffickers, Sicilian drug traffickers. 
and they were connected to Hoffa, you know, going back to the 1930s. And so shameless self-promotion, we did an episode. You can look through our library on um, Detroit Cosa Nostra family and its ties to the global drug trade, which a lot of that plays in with, with Hoffa. He, he plays a big role in you know, that too. The last thing I'll say in terms of who was the actual trigger man, it's a theory that the FBI has just in the last decade really solidified in their mind. And right now, as we're approaching, we're, we're past the 48 year mark going towards 50. It is a consensus amongst investigators right now that Tony Palazzolo was the killer. And that's a name that does not get mentioned when, when we're talking about this narrative. Uh, Sally Bugs Bergulio, who was one of Tony Pro's guys in New Jersey. Billy Jack has gotten a lot of uh, name recognition. But right now, at, at this part of the investigation, the belief is that Tony Powell did it and that Tony Powell leveraged his role in it to, to go pretty high up in, in the Detroit mob and was someone that, according to the investigators, there were people that knew this and that it, it, and it became currency for him around the country. And well, he was the, caught on surveillance talking yeah. about it. Which and then he was caught remarkable. in the, yeah, in the 90s. <laughs> it was he a was drug, up, drug sting, right? Uh, it was uh, Palazzolo was running a uh, money laundry for drug dealers. Yeah. Okay. Um, so he wasn't actually dealing the drugs. He was taking the drug dealers money and cleaning it for them. Okay. Uh, and was doing it between Detroit and Canada. Right. Yeah. And you Windsor was part of that. And they, and so they had a bug, they, they had a bug them. in his headquarters, which was the Detroit sausage company. Yeah. Well, and that was, that's what he said. We ground him up into he sausage, put, which, which I think that way, part's bullshit. I think too. Right. I think he was being, he was busting balls. I don't, yeah. I don't think that's true. And, and sort of your point about, you know, in some ways feeding disinformation about what, what happened to him. He eventually um, became a capo and then a uh, conciliary. He died of stomach cancer. Not four long years ago. ago. Yeah. yeah 2019, ago. 2019. So um, let's, let's, let's reveal our, our big number one. Yeah. Speaking of Sicilian drug traffickers, <laughs> someone who actually uh, knew knew Frankie Coppola, our number one, I think a lot of you probably guessed it by now, is the murder of Carmine Galante, former boss of the Bonanno crime family. July 12th, 1979. Yeah, I would say probably the most infamous mafia hit. Um, I guess you could say maybe Castellano or I, well, I, I should say the St. Valentine's Massacre. If we're, if we're talking about nationally, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, but that's obviously in the winter. The Castellano hit is in the winter. So um, if we're talking New York, uh, I think, the, you know, Galante hit is, is up there as one of the most iconic. Um, and if we're talking about the summer, I, I, I'm pretty comfortable placing that number one. Pretty gruesome. I mean, it, and, it, uh, and it made headlines across the not just across the country, but uh, around the globe. The guy they called the cigar, the man they called the cigar, died with a cigar in his mouth. Um, it, it can't get more, uh, you know, poetic. I don't know if poetic justice is the right way to say it, but that was like tailor made for a Pulitzer Prize winning photo of his of the crime scene. It was um, apropos, uh, and he was another fascinating guy. I have a particular interest in Galante. You know, my my primary case study is. Castellamare del Golfo. And so Galante was not, not, he wasn't born there, but his, his parents were. So he was Castellamare's. And uh, Galante would travel uh, internationally and um, t to Canada, to Sicily. So he was um, part of the original heroin pipeline from Sicily to the United States going back to the 1950s. Specifically, the uh, you know fifty seven conference in Palermo with uh, Luciano Bonanno, uh, Badalamente, Frankie Coppola, um, Papa John Preziola was there. By the way, Detroit heavyweight. Um, this is sort of now I'm going on a tangent here, but talking about Detroit being underappreciated, uh, you know, at this international conference, even some of the five families didn't have representatives at that conference, and uh, the Gambinos and Bonanos did, but. Um, uh, Chicago didn't, um, you know, Cleveland didn't, but Detroit had a, a representative there. So uh, he also is tasked with uh, taking over Montreal for the Bonanno crime family. So he's a really interesting guy, a really mean guy. Um, he's probably involved in the assassination of Carlo Tresca, um, anti-fascist activist in, in New York City during World War II, like a, a thorn in Mussolini's side. 
So Galante is at the intersection of all these interesting stories. He goes to prison on a drug charge. And I believe what, he was I believe he was in prison with Hoffa. He was. They actually got yeah. I I think they they were kind of bosom buddies at first and then I think they had a falling out. Regarding Provenzano, I think. Yeah. I think yes. the falling out with Provenzano put him at odds with some of the other Italian bosses. Yeah. So um there is another Hoffa connection here. Uh, it's interesting because while Galante's in prison, there is an uprising within the Bonanno crime family, and um, uh, some people oppose Joe Bonanno, like uh, Gaspar Di Gregorio, who's another Castellamare's mafiosi or mafioso, and uh, he's backed by Stefano Magadino in Buffalo. It gets very complicated, and other Castellamare's, and and he's he's actually related to both Di Gregorio and Bonanno, and Joe Bonanno loses just. Long story short here, Joe Bonanno loses, goes into exile in Arizona. But there's an argument to be made that if Galante were on the street, back to my point of him being a mean, <laughs> mean, uh, you know, badass motherfucker, uh, he was the Soto Capo, the underboss. And there's an argument to be made that if he were on the street, Joe Bonanno may not or might not have lost that, that civil war. So when Galante gets out of prison, he's got some scores to settle. He, he He's mad that some guys didn't side side with Joe Bonanno during that that war. He's also got a hard on for um, he doesn't like Carlo Gambino. He doesn't like Frank Costello. He, he, he bombs even though, Frank, though, even though those, those guys are dead. Yeah, and he bombs Frank Costello's <laughs> right. tomb the day he comes out as some type of message to the rest of the underworld that he's here and now he means business and right. You know, things of the old are in the past and now he's the the new boss of bosses. Yeah, and so it gets kind of murky the the politic the politics of the situation because a, a lot of research indicates that Phil um, Rusty Ristali is the boss of the Bananos at the time, but he's in prison, and so Galante's move is he's in prison. I'm not. I'm on the street now, and he and he sort of by force of will takes over and he, takes over the family, and he alienates and insulates himself. From the yeah. from the rank and file, he brings all these guys over from Sicily. These younger guys and, and surrounds from Castellamare specifically, right? Uh, Cesare Benavente, Baldo Amato, Toto Catalano, and uh, they are his kind of family within a family. They're making a lot of money uh, drug dealing, and he's detached from the street and from a lot of the capos and alienating himself not just within his own crime family but from G the gambinos uh and, and other crime families where by 1979 you have a lot of different major players in the new york underworld that come together for for a common goal which is to get they call him lillo which is what cigar Cigar and Sicilian. No, yeah, but it's actually that's actually the name comes from Camilo. That's okay. where the nickname comes from. Lilo's Camilo. I, I think that the cigar thing was sort of an urban legend that got okay. tied but to it. The 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 decision was that that he had to go. And let's all, let's before we jump into the specifics of his murder on July twelfth, seventy nine. When I think about the, the the top four guys we have here: Bugsy, Hoffa, Giancana. Roselli. And Galante, the, you know, the common thread are all guys that thought they were above it all. They oh, thought yeah. they were bigger than the situation that they uh, like by pure force of will that they could outrun or, uh, you know, get away from what has always happened. That somehow that they were gonna they were gonna change the narrative because they were such a uh, a force of will in their in their personas. I agree. And, the the hubris, like they, yeah. the, I think all four. You could even put Roselli in there. All five had this sort of attitude that no one would dare. Right. That's no one I, would dare <laughs> try right. to take me out because I'm that fucking you know dope. I'm My, that I'm yeah. that much of the the man here that yeah. no one would dare. Oh, and I think with, with Galante, now moving it back to July of 79, Galante thinks there's no way Cesare Bonaventure and Baldo Amato are going to betray yeah. me. These are my guys. Yeah. These guys are with me every day. I, I, I trust them like they're my own sons because they're young guys. They're what, 25 years old, 26 years old. 
Yeah. And and Bon Ventry has the pedigree too. He's Castel yeah. Marais, and uh, his his uh, uncle Giovanni Bon Ventry was a was a high ranking member at one time. Didn't and I, ranked- just, I just just for clarification, Catalano was was oh, not from Castel Marais, but he was a, he was a zip. He was from okay. Sicily. I, I can't remember off the top of my head where he was from, but um, but Amato and Bon Ventry absolutely were from Castel Marais. So he's surrounded with these guys. They're making a lot of money. As Scott points out, Galante is. Also, basically trying to monopolize the heroin trade because you know the Gambinos are kind of partners with them. He's trying to muscle them out, and and even the other families who aren't in it as deep as the Bonanos and Gambinos, but they they still have their hands in it. And Galante is basically trying to to monopolize the 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 heroin trade. And as you point out, he he's ruffling a lot of feathers, but he's he's he has hubris, right? He's like I I can do it, and no one's going to stop me. Well, so they know that he's going to. Uh, a lunch on July 12th in Brooklyn. Uh, I, it's a restaurant. It was called Joe and Mary's. Yeah. And it was owned by a cousin of his. I believe th- I believe so. Yes. Or, or he was that. going to meet his cousin there. Or one of his cousins was with him. I think Tur- Leonard Torino was another of the, the yeah, victims. I'm, emb- I'm embarrassed. I can't remember. Uh, I believe some either the owner of the restaurant or Torino was leaving for Italy uh, that day week or that weekend so it was kind of like a goodbye have a good vacation lunch well there were def- and and those were the um what's the term uh for uh casual the um casualties of war that aren't intended yeah, collateral, dam- collateral, collateral damage collateral damage yeah. yeah right so he's at joe and mary's he's on the patio kind of in a private uh table bonaventry and amato are there at the table his bodyguards his bodyguards <laughs> Uh, and a car pulls up with masked gunmen. It, it turns out, we find out later that the gunmen are Bruno and Delicato, Anthony and Delicato, who they call Bruno, who's actually still around. Um, and he was the son of, uh, Sonny Red, one of the powerful couples at that time. Uh, Sonny Red's right hand, a uh, big Trini, uh, Dom Trinchera. Who was the mentor of Vinny Gorgeous Bastiano? He, uh, Vinny Gorgeous was was Big Trini's driver, and then a, a lesser known guy, uh, Russ Morrow, uh, I believe, were the th- the three shooters that weren't Bonaventure and Amato, who also got some shots in. Yeah, that's that's been I've heard that from multiple sources, including Frank Panessa, another yeah. shameless plug here who's been on our show. He he was undercover DEA agent. He was actually working with Bonventry and Amato. And he he's one of our sources that um says Amato and Bonventry plug shot um into him on their way out as they were walking yeah. out. So the three masked men come in, they start spraying the uh patio. Calante and I believe Two other people are, are are dead. Um, and yeah, Toronto was killed for sure, and I, uh, I think Coppola too. I'm yeah, embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. And I'm then crazy. FBI surveillance has Bruno and Delicato traveling to Little Italy within an hour, I think, and being congratulated out on the street but like yeah, they didn't do this in surveillance footage of that yeah right being congratulated by uh neil de la croach who was the underboss of the gambino so it's not he's being he's being congratulated by a, a boss of another family and both bruno and delicato and cesare bonaventure who are in their 20s right in 1979 become capos based on their roles in in, in the assassination and this is another example of where we're talking about where it's it's not only overdetermined multiple reasons why people want him dead, but also multiple families kind of, you know, working with each other. And I, I think that's what, what you have with the with the Hoffa hit too, by yeah. the way. It's not I I think Detroit quarterbacked it, but I think they were consulting with yeah. the, the Genovese and and probably the outfit too. So you you had a situation where it stabilized things for a second um, between 79 and 80. Things kind of got copacetic again in that family. But by 81, um, things were fraying. 
and the family was split. And we, we've talked about this and people probably know that are watching us. The Donnie Brasco three capo slain, which was fallout from the Galante hit two years later when Sonny Red, uh, Big Trini and, and Phil Lucky uh, are snuffed out in a big power play by Joe Messino and Rusty Ristelli. And, and Bruno was supposed to be killed. First of all, he was supposed to be killed at the 2020 club when they drew them there and, and, and shot them all to death. But Bruno, uh, for some reason, did not go to that meeting. And then Donnie Brasco, Joe Pistone, was, was given the contract on Bruno to get, to get made into the mafia. But they pull him out of the undercover uh, operation. Bruno was able to survive it and then go on to live another five, ten lives in the mafia. Uh, he's been in and out of prison a couple more times, convicted of the Galante hit, then convicted of uh, the Frank Santoro hit with Vinny Gorgeous back in the early 2000s. Just came out of prison last year. He's in his 70s. Yeah, just to to, to clarify here, I'm looking at um, the book from Ralph Blumenthal, The um, Last Days of the Sicilians. And uh, yeah, you're you're right. Uh, Joe Toronto was his cousin, Cugino, his cousin. He owned the restaurant, and and he and uh, Leonardo Coppola are um, killed as well. And uh, I, I, I'd have to double check. I'm I'm not sure they were in the intended targets. I, I think they may have just gotten the way, but definitely, you know, Galante was. Uh, this was a coordinated attack on him. Yep. So, I, I think it's a pretty well deserved honor for him. Uh, <laughs> that was uh, that was that shocked the system in in New York. Uh, it, it, had, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was saying, well, the, I mean, the, he had the Joe Colombo thing that, that had been seven years before that. But I, I don't think anybody expected uh, one of the uh, the Dons of the five families at that point to be uh, you know, assassinated in a insurgency like we saw happen. Yeah, and a very public execution. And I agree with you about shocking the system because it really changed the landscape because we, we talked about Rastelli. And with Galante out of the way, there there was a real shift, political shift in the Bonanos back to the Italian American side of the the Borgata. And the fact that Amato and Bonventre sold him out shows you that the Sicilians were were basically shifting their their support to, um, rest, uh, you know, Rusty. Rusty. And and then the Sicilians also were part of the killing of the three captains, which yep. was to benefit. Rostelli and yep. uh, Messino. And so then, the, the, after Galante goes, the Sicilians really are no longer this kind of like uh, semi-autonomous faction within the Bananos. They they pretty much get behind the Italian American leadership. Yeah, and um, when you're talking about Bonaventure, he didn't get along with Rostelli, and he was murdered in 1984. So that's five years later, yeah, right? And his murder is. Uh, triggered, no pun intended, by a sit down he had with Rostelli, where I, he, I think he got up and left in the middle of the sit down because he was mad at what Rostelli was telling him. And I think he gave Rostelli a go fuck yourself. I'm not listening to you. Yeah. And my understanding is, is that the, the Sicilians were, were getting behind the Italian American leadership. But a lot of this is this sort of kind of paranoia you see with Scarfo and guys like that is. Bonventre was the one guy they suspect that Messino and, and Rostelli suspected if, if, if the Sicilians did want to sort of make, um, a move. make a move, he was the one guy with the charisma and the yeah. juice, even though I don't think he wanted to. I, re I really don't. I, I think they killed him for no reason. I mean, maybe the, 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 well, the slight or, yeah. you know, that, but, but I don't, I don't think he was conspiring. I mean, I think Bonventre was, was happy with, with his, you know, position within that Borgata, but, but, if if there were if there were someone to to to, to take that mantle and kind of re resuscitate the Sicilian faction, it would have been him. So I don't think they trusted him. And how they got him into the car where they killed him, they told him that he was going to meet Rastelli, and that he thought that he could go make amends with Rastelli. Yeah, apologize for telling him to go fuck off or you know mitigate the damage he had done in the weeks prior, and it was just a way to. To murder him. Yeah, and there's another interesting footnote to that where when Sal Vitale, who was Messino's underboss and brother in law, when he became a cooperator, they asked him what was the what was the 
rules of engagement of Baldo Amato shows up with Cesare and he said Messino said kill him too. And when that came, when that was disclosed, Messino was he 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 made sure he got word to the zips within the family. I I never said that. I yeah. didn't say I didn't say kill Baldo because because he Baldo, probably did. Which he probably did. Yeah, because but, but, Baldo <laughs> Baldo was a player in that family into the two thousand. One hundred percent right. Yeah. And he had a lot of guys behind yeah. him. So Messino was he wanted to make sure. No, I I never said that. I didn't yeah. say kill the whole Baldo. Gianni, Giannini crew was at one of the you know Cafe Giannini. I believe either Amato owned it or was a had people fronting. Yeah, those are his ownership. guys. Yeah. And he and he was still connected to Sicily. So um there's just kind of an interesting footnote. But yeah, I think this was a fun episode, a little different, historical, a little bit you know, we don't we don't do a lot of list, but um it's kind of fun to to mix it up and do something like that. So um we'll see we'll be interesting to get the feedback from people in the comment section what they think if we missed any or if they would rearrange the list. All right. Well like, subscribe, share. Uh, we'll be back next week with another full episode for Ben Behind the Glass, the Dr. Jimmy Bucciolato, and myself, Scott Bernstein, OG Pod, out.